All right. Thank you so much. Welcome to you all. Um, and in the um, overall practice of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, we always start our uh, virtual calls and sessions four minutes after the uh, after the time. So we want to keep this good uh, this good practice. I'm Bertrand de la Chapelle. I'm the executive director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. I'm very happy to see you here. Uh, thanks for taking the time in this compact agenda to uh, hear more about what Internet and Jurisdiction uh, is doing. What are the uh, activities, what is the timeline. I see some familiar faces, but I'm also extremely happy to see uh, other actors uh, that I hope will be um, uh, excited about the topics that we address and also the methodology that we try to uh, implement. So without further ado, um, I want to, to start maybe with the first, the first slide, which is to basically say why. And you know that there's too often a tradition that people have solutions to problems or to at least the problems that they see. And so they come to a place and they fight around their solutions. And they don't spend enough time to think about what is the problem that they're trying to address. And in particular, is there a way for them to formulate this problem as a common problem and not as a problem that they have with each other? And so this is a large part of what we've been uh, doing in the early years. I mean, Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, as we will explain in more detail later on, was created in 2012. And we spent a significant amount of time early on to identify what are the issues that need to be addressed when we talk about the tension between the cross-border Internet and national jurisdictions. And you will see that we have three programs that deal with very concrete issues, but what I want to highlight as a starting point is that this general architecture of the international system that we know, that we're familiar with, that is embedded and embodied fully in the international organizations, like the one that we're in today, this international system is based on a fundamental principle of the separation of territorially based sovereignty, national sovereignty. And those two elements that they are separate sovereignties and that they are territorially based are a huge, are confronted with a big challenge in the current environment where the wonderful instrument that is the internet and all the application it supports is introducing transborder or cross-border interactions not as a rare exception, but as the practical daily norm. And so in order to address the issues that come from this tension, this conflict between the cross-border internet and national jurisdictions, which is by the way a very fundamental question, which is what is the digital society that we want to build together? Who sets the norms? Who implements them? Who enforces them? We have to reconcile three objectives that are often presented as competing and that we strongly believe can be reconciled. And those three objectives are, as you see here, in order to preserve the cross-border internet that we care about, we need to reconcile the fight against abuses of all sorts, and you know that on a daily basis the list seems to expand uh, by the day, but doing so in preserving and even promoting human rights and due process, and at the same time, ensuring a vibrant digital economy. And when I say vibrant, it means also that it can work for small actors like big actors. And I purposefully, and I insist on this, purposefully use the word reconcile those three objectives rather than balancing those three objectives. Because balancing always gives an impression that you have to sacrifice one element for the other. Here the objective is to make sure that you pursue and we collectively pursue those three things um, uh, together. So that's the general landscape and as you will see, we, um, we will present the work that is being done in three very concrete issues that are often in the, in the press and that require a careful coordination 
communication and cooperation between the different categories of actors. And those three topics are, how do you ensure that when a crime is committed somewhere, you have the instruments and the investigating authorities have the capacity to obtain the information, the digital evidence that is needed to conduct the investigation across borders. The second one is, and you've seen that in the press a lot, what are the rules that should apply to the takedown or the restrictions of content on major user-generated platforms? Terrorism, harassment, um, child abuse images, um, disinformation, you, you name it. And the third element is when and under which conditions should or could a domain name in the DNS system be taken down because of the activity or the content on the site underneath. So with that, I will um, give the floor to Paul Fellinger, who is the uh, Deputy Director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, to explain a little bit more what the organization uh, is about and the activities. And we will then go, among other things, to uh, the um, uh, three moderators of the contact groups that are discussing each of those issues at the moment. Paul, you're next. Absolutely. Um, welcome, everybody, to this session. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so for those of you who don't know the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network yet, um, just very briefly, um, it is a multi-stakeholder organization that was founded in 2012. Um, it engages over 200 key entities um, from six stakeholder groups uh, around the world, um, states, um, internet companies, technical operators, civil society groups, academia, and international organizations um, from over 40 countries around the world. And the goal, as Plan de Tron de la Chapelle stated, is to enable multi-stakeholder cooperation as a neutral secretariat between those actors in order to help them to develop the necessary policy standards and operational solutions to precisely those three challenges um, that Bertrand pointed out. Um, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, the Secretariat, has three main missions, connect, inform, and advance. Um, connect means that um, we, as the Secretariat, try to serve as the connective tissue. We have organized over or participated in over 140 events since 2012 to connect the different actors, to raise awareness on the challenges and to build this policy network as it is today. Um, and um, we also, and we will come to this in a second, um, um, since 2016 the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network organizes global conferences and we have um, the partner of the second conference um, that took place in February of this year that, um, to the left, which is the government of Canada and the government of Germany, the part of our next conference, to, to, to my right, and we will, um, they will have the floor in, in, in a bit. Next to connecting the different actors, another core mission of the Secretariat is to enable evidence-based policy innovation. So our um, other mission is to inform the different stakeholders um, about the ongoing trends, the ongoing initiatives, so that there can be an evidence-based dialogue between them. So to this uh, end, there's the INJ Observatory Network between world-leading experts in this field um, from, um, um, from 28 um, um, universities around the world, from over 17 countries. There is, and if you have not um, seen it, I encourage you to visit it on our website, the INJ Retrospect Database, which since 2012, in an open access form, tracks all the different jurisdictional tensions around the world with cases and examples um, that are fully searchable from more than 120 countries uh, as of today. And we will come to this um, soon. Um, we will also um, um, launch um, status reports on the state of jurisdiction on the internet. And the core mission of the Secretariat is to advance um, um, the development of shared frameworks of policy standards and operational solutions in those um, three groups or thematic programs, data and jurisdiction, content and jurisdiction, and domains and jurisdiction. And to my left, you have the three coordinators of the current intersessional work. If I can have the next slide. Um, the most important thing about the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, next to its multi-stakeholder nature, is probably its structured and iterative methodology, which goes from establishing a common understanding of what is the problem among the different actors to defining then 
areas for cooperation. Within those areas of cooperation, concrete policy options where the actors see that cooperation needs to happen but also can happen in a very pragmatic and solutions-driven way to then come to hopefully operational solutions through cooperation. And the next slide um, shows basically the timeline um, between the different global conferences from the first one to the third one next year. And um, you basically see that the first global conference of the policy network took place in Paris um, in partnership with the French government and it established the so-called areas for cooperation. Based on those and thanks to international work and contact groups, um, there was an input document into the second global conference in Ottawa in February of this year, which was the so-called policy options document for each of the three programs. They are available on our website if you want to read them. And um, the outcome of the Ottawa conference, and we will present this in more detail at this year, was the adoption of work plans and the Ottawa roadmap. Um, and right now, um, and um, the coordinators will explain this in detail, um, there are multi-stakeholder contact groups preparing, based on the mandate of the Ottawa Roadmap, um, proposals for operational solutions that will be discussed in Berlin. Um, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, and um, I want to take the opportunity um, to thank um, the Government of Canada as the partner of the second global conference and also uh, the institutional partners, um, the OECD, UNESCO, where we are here today, the European Commission, the Council of Europe of ICANN, who were the supporters um, um, of the Second Global Conference. And with this, I would like to give the floor um, to Lisa Tass, who is the Senior Policy Analyst at ISED Canada and the Canadian representative to the GATT in ICANN. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today and also happy to bring some gender equality uh, to the panel. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Paul and Bertrand for organizing this session at the IGF and inviting me to speak today. As Paul was saying, I work with the Government of Canada in the Department of Innovation, Science and Economic Development, managing the Internet Governance Team and representing Canada at the Governmental Advisory Committee to the Corporation for the Internet, to the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN. Uh, we think the uh, IGF remains a key place to build momentum for this type of global and bottom-up multi-stakeholder efforts. We think it is also crucial not only to preserve this, but empower this multi-stakeholder collaboration and innovation because there is a real need to reinforce uh, a collective opportunity where all stakeholders have a role to play. I'm here today to speak to you about the successful outcomes of the second Global Internet and Jurisdiction Conference, which the Canadian government had the pleasure to co-host and participate with the Canadian Internet Registration Authority, CIRA. And it, this took place in Ottawa, February 2018, building from the results of the first global conference in Paris. The Ottawa conference brought together around 250 global senior level participants from more than 50 countries representing governments, international organizations, internet companies, civil society, and academia. We believe the outcome of the conference was a major milestone in the global governance space where participants adopted, as Paul mentioned, the Ottawa Roadmap. Our Minister of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development, Navdeep Baines, also delivered video remarks uh, at the beginning of the conference, stressing the importance that the internet remains open, interoperable and secure, and to continue to promote innovation, democracy and inclusiveness, which are key principles uh, for Canada. The Ottawa conference leveraged the expertise of a diverse group of stakeholders in advancing um, ways we can address these challenges uh, when it comes to the coexistence of the borderless um, internet and national jurisdictions uh, in a coordinated way and really striving to policy coherence. That was, that, was, that was a key message and giving an equal voice to each player. As you all know, nowadays most online interactions and data flows 
involve multiple jurisdictions based on the location of users, servers, internet platforms, or technical operators. Companies are being asked to handle an increasing number of cross-border requests related to content, to data and domains, and this potentially raises liability, human rights, legal or operational issues, among others. The Ottawa Roadmap consists of uh, work plans with common objectives and also structuring questions in the three work streams uh, that were discussed, mentioned earlier, cross-border content takedown, the second one, cross-border access to user data, and third, a cross-border domain name suspension. And uh, this have been guiding the intersessional work to the lead up to the third conference taking place in Berlin in 2019. And the objective of the roadmap is to really focus towards the development of frameworks, of common standards, and operational solutions. It is ambitious and the task uh, is not easy, but by working together, we, uh, we are making good progress. I, would, I also wanted to highlight that for the Canadian government, our participation in the Ottawa Conference has reinforced connections at various levels internally within the government and has also strengthened our horizontal collaboration across the various government departments, including justice, Canadian heritage, global affairs, and public safety. And this has ensured a more cohesive and multidisciplinary consideration uh, of policy issues. After the Ottawa conference, we continue to exchange notes and we are participating um, at the expert level uh, in the different contact groups. We're also very happy to have uh, Robert Young, our colleague from Global Affairs, that as the, one of the main coordinators of the data contact group. And I know he'll be speaking to you about that work a bit later. And so uh, in conclusion, uh, thinking about the lead up to Berlin, we, we want to encourage everyone to continue to be aware of the linkages and cross-cutting implications uh, with like across the different content groups. I think that's something very important. Um, we would also like to recognize uh, the immense efforts that all the participants of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network have been leading intersessionally uh, to develop innovative uh, bottom-up and collective solutions uh, to um, challenging global governance issues, uh, and we believe it's been done in an inclusive and creative manner. Uh, we, we think the multi-stakeholder efforts uh, are, pivotable, are pivotal to furthering the conversation and really trying to identify the concrete and practical steps that can be implemented and that have the potential to scale. So we think find, it's about finding imaginative approaches, integrating innovation in policy development at the start, and promoting procedural interoperability for cross-border requests are all key elements that we should continue to strive for in implementing the Ottawa Roadmap uh, to Berlin. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Luisa. Um, if I can have the, the, the next slide, um, and Luisa mentioned already um, um, those key points. I encourage everybody in the room, if you haven't done so, um, you can find the Ottawa Roadmap on the website internetjurisdiction.net um, and I recognize that um, um, I see a lot of um, people in the room who actually were in Ottawa and, and, and worked on, the, on those outcomes. Um, there were basically six main outcomes. Uh, um, one was a call for more legal certainty in, cybers, um, in cyberspace. It was um, reassessed that there is a need for policy standards and frameworks and also to ensure policy coherence and legal interoperability. And there was a renewed uh, um, commitment to collaboration and joint action that we right now see um, also happening in the multi-stakeholder contact groups. Um, we will come to the common objectives and work plans um, of those contact groups um, in, in just a second. Um, I just want to highlight another outcome that we want to announce, if I can please have the next slide, on the occasion of the Internet Governance Forum here in Paris and also the Paris Peace Forum, which takes place at the same time and where the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network was one of the selected organizations that were showcased there. Um, responding to this call in Ottawa on more policy coherence and to enhance the Secretariat's um, 
um, efforts um, to provide evidence or to help to provide evidence-based policy information, more information, there was really a call for more policy coherence in the ecosystem. It took hours at the global conference that assembled world-leading experts from all the different stakeholder groups to just understand what are the different processes in the different areas, who does what, what are the events, what is already underway, what laws are adopted where. And um, I think this was a very strong call to which the Secretariat will respond. So we will launch the world's first global status report on the state of jurisdiction on the internet, which will map the past, current and emerging trends the relevant actors who work on solutions and the, who propose solutions to those challenges. And um, this will be based on an unprecedented data collection um, from the different actors engaged in the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, in addition to a public review to which I invite also people at the IGF to participate in early 2019 so that the first iteration of this Global Status Report can be launched in time for the third Global Conference in Berlin. If I can please have the next slide. So now we are uh, moving to the concrete part of the um, outcomes of Ottawa and the um, three contact groups that are being uh, set up. Uh, I want to, um, to mention that the Ottawa roadmap and the outcomes of the Ottawa conference was uh, presented to various international organizations and, and meetings. Uh, and we're very happy also that it was referenced by the, uh, the report of the uh, Izeshima uh, G7 uh, group on cyber that took place uh, this year. What is important is that, as it was said, people in Ottawa agreed on common objectives. And you remember when we started this, I said we need to come a common understanding of the problem, then common objectives. That's where we are at, and if I can have the next uh, the next slide, which might be a little bit small, but in a nutshell, there are three contact groups of about 35 people that are dealing with each of the three programs that I mentioned earlier, on cross-border access to user data in criminal investigation, on cross-border content restrictions, and on cross-border domain suspensions. Once again, balancing or uh, reconciling the three objectives that mentioned uh, before. And the timeline for this is that those groups were composed um, and started working in, in July. They will have a certain number of virtual meetings and one physical meeting in Paris uh, at the end of January or beginning of February. They bring together about 120 people all together and those three contact groups have together 12 subgroups, 12 working groups that deal with on uh, sub-issues to go in more detail on what can be operationalized. And so this process will end in March, at the end of March 2019, so that between March or the beginning of April and the beginning of June, where the conference, the third global conference will take place in Berlin, there will be opportunities for people to discuss those elements and uh, be aware of what is being uh, suggested and proposed. I want to highlight one thing because Paul mentioned the notion of methodology. We are trying to navigate as a secretariat a very uh, narrow path but an important path between just documenting what is, which was already useful but not sufficient, and going too far in the direction of something that would be normative which we have no mandate for. This is a voluntary effort, this is just bringing the actors together and what we're telling them is you are here because you're trying to find solutions and we are here to provide you a neutral and safe space to explore what can be. What if people were willing to move a little bit in one direction so that the others accept to make a little movement as well. The end result will still remain voluntary, but this is why we use the expression policy standard. It's just like a technical standard. Technical standard has no enforceability but the fact that it works or not. And so if there is a critical mass of actors that accept to adopt certain procedures or certain practices, then it makes the system work. And as Vint Cerf said in one of the sessions that we, uh, that we hosted a long time ago in the very early days, things that work persist. And that's the goal. Make things that are useful for people so that governments, companies, civil society actors 
can see exactly and have a better understanding of what the others are doing, how they will behave, and to make a pun for our friends from uh, the ICANN community, think of it as mutual affirmation of commitments in the plural. Anyway, this is the timeline. So the, the key horizon is, is Berlin, but of course, it doesn't stop in Berlin because even if there's an agreement, there's a whole phase for the things that will have progressed sufficiently of who is willing to test, to implement, to work towards operationalizing the, the proposals. So with that, I would like to uh, move to uh, each of the working groups, uh, of the contact groups, sorry. And the first one is data and jurisdiction, and I will ask um, Robert Young, who, as Lisa said, is the legal counsel of the uh, Department of Global Affairs in Canada. And if you could, yes, you are on the, on the next slide already, bravo. Um, and Robert, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, Bertrand, and uh, merci pour l'invitation. I'll give my remarks in English, um, but happy to answer questions in either of Canada's official languages. Well, good afternoon, and many thanks for the invitation. As mentioned, I have the pleasure of coordinating the uh, work of the Data and Jurisdiction Group as part of the Ottawa Roadmap. I'm perhaps uniquely placed uh, in that role in that, um, unlike any other members of the group, I actually live in Ottawa. So I have a hard time forgetting about the roadmap. It's on my thoughts just about every day. Indeed, when I walk to work uh, every day, I cross over a couple of historic bridges in Ottawa, under which uh, Bertrand and Paul and I did some canoe paddling, a very Canadian thing to do, uh, not in February at the Global Conference, but at a preparatory meeting some months before. So uh, I, I'm unable to forget every time I walk to work that I'm supposed to be doing something for Paul and Bertrand in uh, Paris, but also for the broader community. So it, it, that's worked out very effectively uh, to stimulate our work. Um, maybe just briefly uh, remind you of the um, common objective for our data and jurisdiction group. It has six points. I'll just read it slowly, but it is, of course, in the Ottawa Work Plan and on the website. So the, the, the common objective was the definition of high substantive and procedural standards allowing relevant authorities from specific countries in investigations regar regarding certain defined types of crimes with a clear nexus with the requesting country to directly submit structured and due process respecting requests to private companies in another country to obtain the voluntary disclosure of user data irrespective of where the data is stored. Sounds simple, doesn't it? So that is, our, that is our task. We have begun our work, and it, I'm happy to be able to tell you here that it's proceeding well. Through the wonders of technology, we are able to meet as a group virtually, uh, most of us with video and chat functions enabled, from four or five continents during every one of our calls, and I can't tell you how many time zones are involved in every single call. I won't list the um, members uh, of our group by name, but I think the, the list can come up here on the screen. Uh, maybe a bit small. I didn't, I'd really invite you to take a minute and um, have a look on the Internet and Jurisdiction website to, to see the, uh, all the folks who have volunteered to be members of that group. It's an expert group. It's a diverse group, um, more diverse at least in terms of gender than today's panel, I can assure you. And um, it, importantly, it represents all of the major stakeholder groups, uh, government, civil society, the different branches of industry, and so on. So let me just take a moment uh, before I start to talk to you about, about the work of the group so far, just to thank the members of the group. Uh, quite a number of them are here at the IGF this week and some in the room today. And clearly we wouldn't be able to make progress on our, on our work without their dedication and their contributions. Um, and I really wanted to underline that uh, thanks to them and the, the, the approach, the spirit that they're bringing to the work, our work is proceeding in a very open and a very cordial manner, a very respectful and, and practical manner, notwithstanding some very different and at times competing perspectives about what are the priorities, what, what, should, be, uh, what should be determinative of how some of these solution, uh, some of these problems are addressed. Um, the diverse perspectives, of course, make for rich discussions uh, and the respectful approach means that we are able to move forward uh, in a meaningful way. 
I should maybe mention, I think, uh, although I work for the Canadian government now, I spent much of my career working for the International Committee of the, of the Red Cross, including in conflict zones around the world. And I think Bertrand Paul invited me to, um, to, to play this role as neutral coordinator, figuring there might be contentious discussions and that perhaps armed conflict might break out between the, um, between the different diverse stakeholders with very strong views and experiences. But I'm slightly disappointed to report to you today that it's, there has been no armed conflict in the data and jurisdiction group. Indeed, the discussions, as I said, have been cordial and respectful. So I, I'm not sure my experience is, is, is as relevant as, as might have been thought. So our work is gaining momentum. Uh, we've been meeting not only in the contact group, but in f uh, a number of smaller working groups. We started with four. We, of course, had guiding questions like all of the groups. We had 15, and so amongst ourselves, we uh, focus, decided to focus initially on four uh, and, uh, and uh, w areas where we think we can make the most progress quickly. So based on our discussions to date, I'm, I'm quite confident that we're going to be able to together in the contact group identified areas where we can make some tang tangible, pro tangible progress. What I mean to say is I expect we will be able to deliver some concrete proposals by next spring to the larger community, including all of you, um, in order that uh, there can be further consideration and discussion and debate before we arrive in Berlin. So I won't discuss uh, all of our work in detail today, but let me just mention three areas of priority and promise. Um, the first is interoperable requests uh, and order formats. And I should say we'll often use the term requests, but as some group members of our group have insisted, what are requests often involve orders. So when I say requests, I, I mean both. So we know there are already a multitude of formats and forms for requests and orders uh, in use. And there are also many proposals in play coming from different corners. So the diversity of these is positive because it's meant, it means solutions have been crafted by different actors to meet their needs. Whether it's a company that wants to have some framework for incoming requests, whether it's a government, whether it's uh, something that's being considered in the uh, Budapest uh, Convention protocol negotiations. So the diversity is a positive uh, development, I think. It, it, it gives us a growing collection of best practices. At the same time, it in some ways adds to the interoperability challenges. Um, at this stage, it, I don't think it'd be easy. This is the view of our group, our conclusion, nor would it ever would it necessarily be desirable to try and develop one standardized global, global format for um, requests and orders, if it ever was possible and desirable. So instead, our group is focusing on a, a the development of a proposal that would harmonize rather than standardize uh, on the, on the for, um, issue of request formats. This is being uh, done through the de development of what we're calling for short tags. And by tags we mean um, categories that, ca that can be identify common elements in the different kinds of orders and requests for data. And by tags, it means that if, if there's a different system between one country or one industry and another, by having tags, it's a little bit like a uh, lexicon that allows us to connect them and allows us to be, in some sense, speaking the same language, even though we have the different systems. So stay tuned for more on tags. The secondary is um, mechanisms for mutual authentica uh, authentication. So um, as we all know, trust is essential when orders or requests are, are crossing borders. Uh, without trust, uh, orders and requests cannot be processed quickly in a timely manner and efficiently. I note that trust is also the theme of our work for the IGF this week. So the work um, that we're doing in that working group is looking at the feasibility of points of contact, some method or methods of pre-verifying requests or orders, in a, in a sense, quality control, although I'm a little bit reluctant to describe it that way, but that, that means that we have some um, sense of, uh, uh, of trust in orders that are crossing borders and arriving on our doorsteps. And then finally, I wanted to mention the third category of work where, where I think we will have something to say by the spring. And this is the vital issue of scalability. Really, it's the issue of how effective approaches to sharing data across borders can be scaled up for broader use to contribute to harmony and to avoid duplication or an increasingly tangled web of competing approaches. 
Scalability, let's be honest, friends, is sometimes the elephant in the room because as different approaches are developed, as different agreements are made bilaterally, multilaterally, with industry, with other partners, um, sometimes we have to acknowledge that certain approaches will include those at the table but exclude others. And so scalability uh, challenges us to think about how solutions that work for some parties might be adapted to a broader set of stakeholders. The previous panel, I understand, that touched on some of these issues brought views from the Global South. And as an increasing number of states are becoming increasingly engaged in these kinds of activities of sharing data across border, we need to see about how we can make our tents bigger to allow more players in while achieving all of the elements of the common objectives. So needless to say, the, the work of this group is fascinating, it's challenging, but I have to say with the diverse human talent in the uh, data and jurisdiction contact group, I'm really looking forward to being able to share innovative and practical incomes with all of you by next spring. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. <clears throat> and I want to highlight that there's a, there's a word that is underpinning this whole thing, given that there are many initiatives that are already existing, and they were addressed in the session, as you said, that took place just before this one. Uh, you get the initiatives in the US with the Cloud Act, you get the initiative in Europe with the e-evidence proposal, and the initiative in the Council of Europe on an additional protocol to the Budapest Convention. One of the key words is the question of interoperability, and the uh, standard for request is one of the key elements, as Robert said, and scalability and how it can expand to cover uh, as many countries as possible with respect for due process is another element. With that, I will uh, give the floor to the second uh, coordinator, <coughs> who is Wolfgang Schulz, who is the director at the Hans Bredow Institute and the, uh, uh, also at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, and he is the coordinator for the content and jurisdiction uh, contact group. Wolfgang, you have the floor. Thanks so much uh, for that, and uh, thanks for all your support. Uh, I'm from Berlin, not from Ottawa, so the Kano tour with Bertrand and Paul is still to come, um, but be prepared. Um, we have some rivers there as well. So um, the um, content and jurisdiction contact group started, uh, obviously, as well as the others, with the um, outcome of uh, Ottawa. And that was uh, basically um, a list of uh, 13 different uh, issues and questions which uh, we all agreed uh, should be the uh, basis for the further work and the outcome we want to produce for Berlin. And um, the members of the contact group, can I have the slide please? Um, um, that is uh, extremely diverse as well. Um, all the stakeholder groups that Paul has mentioned at the beginning are represented in this uh, group. And um, just to show you how diverse this group actually is, we have ardent supporters of the Network Enforcement Act in Germany, for example, as well as people who publicly have argued uh, against it. And so um, I believe that we can only make a difference here when these uh, different uh, uh, positions and stakeholder groups come together. Otherwise, we will not come to practical solutions here. And so uh, I think this group is perfect, the perfect basis to uh, come to uh, results when it comes to content and jurisdiction issues. Um, my thanks to the work that is done here and to the members of the contact group at um, I think it's a marvelous group, and I'm sure that we can come up with tangible outcome in Berlin. We have um, divided the uh, group into four working groups, and I will very briefly uh, present to you what these uh, working groups are actually working on. Um, I will only touch some issues, of course, uh, because it's extremely complex, as you can imagine. The first one is uh, the contact group uh, about taxonomies. Um, and we found in a process that uh, of the many issues that uh, we uh, had discussed in Ottawa, taxonomies are among the most important things. 
And you might think taxonomies that spells instant boredom, uh, why taxonomies? Um, but if you think about, for example, um, categorizing content types, for example, that can be extremely helpful when you uh, t um, categorize them um, in terms of the degree of harm or the kind of harm that is done. Um, we might uh, develop uh, taxonomies here that can be helpful for policymakers, companies, and uh, uh, courts as well. Uh, because when you balance interest, for example, it might be extremely helpful to have a, a taxonomy that is, uh, has been agreed on um, what regards the, the intensity of harm or how imminent harm is uh, when it comes to content. Um, there are other uh, things we are discussing, or the colleagues in the, the uh, working groups are discussing here, that is uh, different types of actors, for example. Um, we are very often just talking about specific actors because it's so obvious, but there are many other actors that was one of the extremely interesting discussions in Ottawa um, to see the many actors that have relevance in uh, the internet governance realm and we are not um, uh, focusing on um, uh, generally when we talk about that. It is also the types of request um, that um, uh, are in the focus of this and also um, the um, transparency uh, elements, how is that linked, for example, to the different types of content and actors. So the first working group, which I think is a, a cross-cutting working group that uh, will coordinate a lot with the other uh, groups that are um, under this umbrella of the content contact group um, is of, of major importance and I'm really looking forward to what comes out of that. The second one is uh, the working group about decision making um, and um, here we focus on elements like response times for example. Um, that the time issue is something that uh, um, is of major importance when it comes to, to how to deal with content in, uh, and jurisdiction issues is obvious I would say and so um, the the uh, question of uh, response time is um, something that uh, has to be looked into and where we want to make some concrete suggestions at the end. Uh, another element in this group is the decision-making chain, for example. What different elements can you uh, distinguish um, when um, there is a decision about uh, uh, taking content down um, by a request from a foreign country, for example, um, um, then it is extremely helpful to see the whole chain and the roles and responsibilities um, that are attached to the different um, um, elements of, of the chain. So that's uh, the second uh, working group decision making. The third one is uh, very obviously closely connected to what the whole uh, content and jurisdiction um, um, working section is all about, that is geographic scope. And um, what um, we look into here is um, into local restriction by local authorities as well as um, the global restrictions. And uh, one idea that um, has been brought up in the discussions is can we finally work out something like a principle of uh, granularity um, as regards the geographical scope when it comes to restriction of content. I think uh, that can be very closely linked to human rights issues and can again, as I said at the beginning, um, be extremely helpful to policymakers, judges and others when we come to a kind of graduation of, of uh, um, intensity of, of extraterritorial uh, effects, for example. So that is one of the many uh, tasks that the, uh, the group graphic scope has uh, to deal with. Uh, and the last one is the recourse uh, group. That was something that um, has been by the group uh, as a whole been decided as one of the extremely important issues that have come up in Ottawa. And uh, therefore will have a own working group to, to deal with. Um, one element that uh, is discussed here is uh, user notification, um, the um, possible notice and takedown approaches and, and things like that are um, um, to 
be discussed here, and of course the uh, often neglected element of appeals and uh, non-judicial procedures uh, allowing users to appeal, for example, uh, will be discussed in this working group. So to wrap it up, um, I believe that uh, we are in a very good position uh, to come up with tangible results in Berlin, and we are working hard uh, to do that. And again, my thanks to the members of the uh, content contact group. Thanks much. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, which brings us to the, uh, the third and last uh, contact group on domains and jurisdiction. <clears throat> I want to highlight one thing that is very important, is that we all know that there is an organization uh, called ICANN that deals with most of the issues that are related to domains. And this domains and jurisdiction contact group is specifically dealing with issues that are not within the remit of ICANN. So there is no overlap. And it's particularly related to the question of should or not and when a domain name be taken down because of the content that is under the, uh, or the activity that is on the site underneath is deemed illegal. And for that, I want to give the floor to uh, Martin Bottermann, who is um, a director and the director of GKNS Consult but he's also, for those of you who know him, a uh, director on the ICANN board. And as in the case of um, uh, Robert Young uh, earlier, uh, this activity as the uh, coordinator of a contact group is totally considered as independent from their position of the ICANN board or in the government of Canada. And we are very appreciative of their willingness to play, uh, to play that role. Martin. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, ICANN board is a big part of my life at the moment, but my interests go beyond that. And uh, I'm very happy to support the work of uh, Internet and Jurisdiction because it's a clear issue that we need to address. The world is changing thanks to the Internet, and it's changing the Internet, and uh, hence my interest. So this is really about... Uh, how do we go uh, along with this in domain suspension across borders? Uh, very much a topic that we're confronted with more and more every day. So I'm very happy that we have the working groups coming and bringing together people who are seeking domain takedowns, who are providing domain takedowns. The, the registries, the registrars, and who are enforcing uh, the main takedowns. Uh, because we can only find a good way forward if we work together on this. In this, we distinguished uh, very importantly that uh, we need to look at, uh, first of all, taxonomies. So what do we actually talk about? When would we take uh, things take down? What is the common concepts? What is the vocabulary we do? Which words do we use? knowing that if you look to this from a global level, words may have different meanings and different things in different cultures in different jurisdictions. So that's, that's the first thing, and we have a working group on that, which is uh, actually chaired by somebody in this room, by uh, Suzanne Chalmers. And uh, another part is then, if you look to notices, uh, how do you notify, uh, how does the notice look if you want to effectively uh, handle on it? And uh, this means that uh, it's good to have a common understanding of how this works. Now, having in the working group also people who already today receive those, we get very practical feedback from those people, like, well, sometimes they just don't know where to send them. We didn't think of that beforehand. That's a practical thing. Uh, what content is it that we need to handle on it? A uh, very practical thing. Uh, so we see that there, together with uh, the practitioners in the field and those who think about uh, how does this work across borders, uh, legal background, etc., how we can come to concepts that will help us forward. When we have notices and when we know what we talk about, the next step is due process because this is, in the end, uh, what holds us liable or not, uh, makes us act 
uh, according to what is expected from us. Uh, but how does this work in an international environment? Uh, how do we work with uh, the fact that sometimes we may get a notice in something that triggers us and we may even agree we want to take action but uh, the legal environment doesn't. Uh, the main uh, objective here is to help us to identify when do we fulfill uh, due process, notification, remediation, what is possible. And the fourth part uh, in all this, and this is a backup of the whole system, is transparency, ensuring transparency that the work covers requests and orders for action uh, sent to DNS operators by courts, uh, public authorities, notifiers, and maybe other private entities. It deals with how to achieve greater, greater transparency regarding the number of requests, the substantive criteria for the submission, the handling. How do we deal with that? Now, in the discussions that we had uh, intermediately also uh, reporting back of those working groups, uh, it becomes very clear that there's a lot of this which is really about awareness. How do we get the right information where? How do people know where even to send the notice? Um, what process to follow? Uh, and what content uh, requirements are there? The other element is that all this will only work when we do it in a way that is scalable. So we are all already thinking about uh, ways of automation of these processes where possible. Not having the illusion everything will be automated, but uh, this will be an important element to make this doable uh, without uh, doubling, tripling, tenfolding the prices of managing internet uh, accounts. So we really think we're moving towards uh, typologies of uh, technical actions that, that and abuse thresholds that we can establish together where we need to take action. Uh, this is our responsibility up and beyond in a way the current legislation in all different countries apart. Uh, we, we try to establish best practices for those notices and notifiers and last but not least uh, the criteria for, for user notification. So we're well on our way in preparation for being more concrete on this in Berlin. Uh, I realize I'm an outlier here amongst my colleagues because I live in Rotterdam. But maybe 2020 Rotterdam, I'm not sure. <laughs> Some Britain stats. <laughs> so uh, with that, uh, I, I can just say that I'm uh, very much uh, appreciative of the good work that the Secretariat is doing because we work with volunteers. We are volunteers. Uh, the people working with us are volunteers. Uh, thanks to the preparatory work of the Secretariat, really grasping the discussions, uh, feeding back uh, uh, lists with suggestions, uh, seeds as they call it, uh, it becomes possible for this group of volunteers to be rather uh, effective and uh, achieve the best possible. And I look forward to uh, presenting those results in Berlin. Thank you very much, Martin. And <clears throat> on that last, last point, we have a, a, a comment that is, the goal is to achieve the highest ratio of uh, time spent to uh, results. And that, that's part of the responsibility of the, uh, of the Secretariat. The second element is that, as you mentioned, this is probably one field, one of the groups where education vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the, of the world and the other actors is important because there is very little knowledge that is sufficiently shared around how the DNS functions and when it is appropriate to do something at that level. Because in a nutshell, when you take down a domain name, it has a global impact and it cannot be in response to illegality that is just at the local level. So there is a real tension in that regard. And understanding of the, uh, of the techniques that are in place and the conditions under which such action should be taken or not is, uh, we hope, a great help in terms of educating and providing guidelines for a larger community. Uh, with that, I will uh, make just one comment that after Ottawa, we made a significant effort to extend the geographic outreach of the, um, of the policy network. 
uh, in particular uh, towards Africa uh, with interactions with the African Union and we are going to put a great emphasis in the year 2019 in that, uh, in that regard. Uh, but also towards Latin America, which already was um, a regional zone that uh, we have interacted with uh, significantly. And in particular, we have strengthened the relationship with the um, uh, Economic Commission for Latin America of the UN, uh, which has become actually the um, additional institutional partner of, or institutional support for the uh, third global conference. And we will, uh, Paul and I, actually travel next week to Santiago uh, in Chile, where we co-organize with the, Latin, uh, the um, Economic Commission of Latin America uh, a special session in Latin America on the issues that we're discussing today. And so with that, uh, it's my pleasure to allow Rudolf Griedel uh, from the, ministry, the German Ministry of uh, Economy and Energy to have the last word before the, the questions, as Germany, uh, as we're ha very happy that Germany is the um, government partner for the third global conference of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network that will take place from 3 to 5th of June 2019 in Berlin. Rudolf, you have to. Thank you. Thank you so much, and good afternoon uh, to everybody. Uh, I think it has been said and it has been shown very clearly what the merits and what the great uh, work of uh, Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network is and uh, that is also the reason why we as a German uh, government, a ministry, but uh, I would say the whole government are very much committed to the process and um, that's also why we are not only actively working in all the uh, three uh, work streams that has be, have been presented here with our different uh, uh, line ministries and beyond uh, from uh, civil society, from the economic sector. Uh, it is also the reason why we uh, decided already some time ago to uh, volunteer and be, a, be the host country of the next, the third uh, international conference. Um, uh, that will take place, as you said, in Berlin from 3 to 5th uh, um, of June of next year. And we see it a little bit as a somehow a logical line going uh, from Ottawa to uh, Berlin and staying then a little bit in Berlin uh, to the next IGF uh, in November. So what, what we would really uh, like to achieve, but I'm very confident that that will be possible, um, to have very concrete, um, tangible uh, outcomes uh, and results of the um, INJ uh, conference in Berlin that we can feed into the IGF uh, 2019 uh, in November. And, and that is actually also a little bit the spirit that we would like to see uh, for the IGF in a more general manner, not, to, uh, not for it to be a one-time event every year, but uh, to be uh, somehow underpinned and fed by a um, a, a process during the whole year and uh, intercessional process if you, if you wish. And I think that uh, internet and jurisdiction and the questions that are being dealt with here are um, one good example of how this could really um, advance the discussions and come to um, these concrete outcomes and, 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 and tangible uh, proposals and, and, and results. So. Um, we are, we, are, we are committed, we are very happy to be part of the process and very proud uh, to be uh, part of the process and um, we, um, we are very much looking forward to host uh, uh, the, the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network's international conference in Berlin uh, in June next year and um, hope to see most of you there and uh, thank you very much for Letting, given us the possibility to be part of this uh, great undertaking. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a mutual thank you because yeah. it's, uh, we are really happy to have uh, uh, the partnership with, with Germany. And I want to make, before we just open the floor, I want to make a bridge with what Luisa was, was saying uh, before as a follow-up to, to Ottawa because it's happening also with, uh, with Germany and we are extremely happy about that. In a nutshell, a, a few years ago, those issues were just dealt with by the few internet governance wonks, and many of us are here still 
graying or getting older, but um, this was a very limited group. At the time, you may remember that I was calling us the net set. We were just hopping from one conference to the next. We still do, but now it concerns much more people. In every single government, it concerns the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Economy, the Ministry of Interior, the Ministries of Justice, the Data Protection Authority, sometimes the Consumer Protection Authorities. It can also con uh, concern the cultural uh, ministries, and the list goes on. And so I'm extremely happy to see that because we, uh, Canada had established that uh, in the preparation for the Ottawa conference, the connection between the different ministries in Canada is continuing in that, in that regard and also between the people who participate in the different contact groups. And I'm extremely grateful because uh, the Ministry uh, of Economy and, and Energy organized uh, last week, basically, last in Berlin. We were in Berlin for a discussion precisely with the different ministries in Germany uh, that are involved, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Ministry of Economy. But also, you were kind enough to invite a certain number of the uh, actors from the industry in, in Germany as well, because it is important to broaden not only the diversity of actors within governments, but also the diversity of actors in the, in the business sector. So with that, uh, we have another good 25 minutes for any questions that you may have to us, to the coordinators, or to the, uh, the respective hosts and uh, the floor is yours. I suppose there should be mics, or you have at your table, actually, the, the mics. The floor is yours. Ah, and there was one remote question that is too far from me, but if you can. Cooperation. He says, how digital cooperation is possible without digital trust in, on an international level? That is from <coughs> Moskabiri. Um, I have an answer, but is, does anybody want to answer the question of how to build um, international trust and what is the relation with cooperation? Martin. Well, it should be in the interest of everybody in the end, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, there will be uh, full peace and harmony for the world forever after. But I think the, the, the invitation is in the open, uh, in the open invitation to, to participate in this. And uh, that's all we can do. And uh, it's on the table. You want to? Let me be just add a, an observation from the global affairs point of view. In, in some fronts of international relations, we see trust is at a particularly low ebb today. But I draw hope, as, as has been mentioned, there, there are common interests. If, if we can have a space station in space, that has two global powers on it cooperating, even if they can't always cooperate and see eye to eye on Earth, I think surely then we can cooperate uh, and build trust for cyberspace. Okay, before we take, we take a question from, from the floor, uh, my, my answer is, first of all, that trust cannot be decreed. It's something that is being built, that is being built through interactions. This is exactly the reason why it is important to bring people around the same table. And let's be honest, a little bit nudge them into seeing that they have a problem in common rather than a problem with each other. And it's only through the provision of a neutral and safe space where they can explore what we call what ifs. Let me, let me explain just very briefly. In many situations, people, when there is mistrust, and there is indeed still mistrust between companies and governments and civil society too often, in most cases, people say, as long as you don't do X, there's no way I'm going to do Y. And you can stay like this for ages, or you did X in the past and don't expect me to do Y now. What we're telling them is, okay, no commitment, innovation, exploration without commitment. You don't guarantee anybody that even what you're proposing or exploring, you will support afterwards. But explore what if. If you were willing to do X, then I would be willing to explore doing Y, not commit. But how would that work? And then you begin to explore, and then you see that, well, actually there are things that can work, and others where there are the real differences. So the answer to your question, which actually is a very good one, 
is that cooperation and trust are actually uh, um, a sort of spiral. It can go down when trust is being destroyed, or it can go up when it is built progressively. And for those of you who are familiar with game theory, uh, cooperation is also something that is at the core of prisoner's dilemma situation. And you know that the only reason why there are prisoner's dilemma situation is because there's no communication between the people who are making decisions separately. And the whole message that we send is that before you get to cooperation, you need communication and knowing what the others are doing, what the others are planning to do, because in most cases, people are working in silos and they very legitimately trying to solve the problems under the pressure of urgency without enough taking into account what is the ripple effect or what the other actors are doing. So communication, then coordination, and then in the end, potential cooperation mechanisms. But if you try to ask for cooperation right off the bat when there's not trust, doesn't work. And I think the spirit that is in the working groups and the contact groups is now also the result of the work that has been conducted since 2012, progressively engaging the different actors and convincing them that there is a benefit in this interaction. I saw a question in the back. Um, a. Don Katz from the World Economic Forum. Um, I'm sorry if it was covered at the, be at the beginning. I, I came just a tiny bit late. Um, I was wondering if anyone had uh, any insights on data embassies. Uh, there was some uh, proposed legislation that I became aware of um, uh, that um, basically in my reading was ceding most um, uh, uh, jurisdictional issues to the home country of, of a business in order to attract uh, foreign direct investment in a particular country. Um, I'm wondering if uh, this type of proposal um, is something that would advance trust among nations or um, uh, uh, lead to uh, tension? Thank you. Maybe, is there any other question yet? No. So I will ask something. I like your question very much. I will ask people on the panel to say, uh, to see whether they have an answer. But I would like also people in the audience or in the room who are as knowledgeable about those issues as many of the people who are here to say what they think about such an ID if they want to, to chime in. So anybody on the panel wants to, to chime in on this notion of data embassies? No? Anybody in the room? Is there anybody in the room that is from Estonia? Ha, huh, too bad, from Luxembourg. <laughs> and you will understand why I ask. Who knows why I ask whether there's somebody from Estonia and from Luxembourg? Raise your hand. Okay, a little bit. Okay, the story is the following. If I understand it correctly, and if I say anything wrong, tell me. Estonia, for whatever reason, um, wants to make sure that its public data is secure in any kind of situation. It can be a physical uh, catastrophe, uh, or it can be whatever political catastrophe. And so surprisingly to many, instead of having an answer that says the solution to data sovereignty is data localization in my country, they said, no, no, no. The solution to our security is to have a backup data thing somewhere else. And they struck a deal with Luxembourg to have a repository that is actually one of the things that I understand can be labeled as a data embassy that allows Estonia to back up everything in a safe environment and data center in uh, Luxembourg that is under extraterritoriality. And I think it's a very interesting question to, to explore. This is a landscape that is changing a lot. Denmark as a technical, uh, sorry, a tech ambassador to Silicon Valley. We're now talking about sovereignty that is not connected exclusively to the territory or not connected always to the territory. When we're talking about the cloud, there's the Cloud Act, but the cloud as such, and the collection of data centers that are around the world, there might be a very interesting discussion about, is there a regime for the cloud that is emerging that says, think of it as a global network of data centers and nobody cares or should care where they're located really, 
what we need is what is the authority of any actor to access this information irrespective of where it is located? And second, what is the extent of the authority of one particular sovereign government on the data centers that are in this country? That's a relatively simple formulation. I don't mean that the solution is easy. But uh, is that what you meant by data embassies or is there another concept? Um, closely related, but what I <coughs> uh, understood from the legislation that I saw was, <coughs> and, I, and I, I won't mention uh, the country, but that right. uh, 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 because I, I um, am not unable to at the moment, um, the, uh, um, uh, that uh, the jurisdiction would rest with the country of origin of the company, um, let's say uh, the U.S., um, and that in order to attract those companies to come to country X, um, they would agree that all laws uh, uh, subject to interaction of citizens of country X would actually be uh, under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Is the formulation that I saw, and it was described to me as data embassy, it sounds like what you're describing is better named data embassy, but, um, but, but the, I'm describing what I saw. Very, uh, very, very interesting. A quick remark, and I want to introduce, and I, I said to, to people that this is a comment that may look a little bit pedantic uh, sometimes, like uh, for those of you who are familiar with Immanuel Kant, there is the uh, concept of the um, uh, critical imperative, which is basically if you want to know without any reference to any supreme being or morals or whatever, whether something that you plan to do is good or not, you just imagine what would happen and how would you would feel if everybody else were doing the same. If you don't like the result, you don't do it. If you like the result, you can do it because it might spread. I think in legislation, this is exactly a, a, a test case, like a rubber hitting the road that should be done. Every time a policy is envisaged, be it by a company or by a government, you should do the count test. Say, what would happen if everybody were doing exactly the same? And in that case, without knowing more about the, uh, the, the proposal, I think it might be interesting to apply the count test from this one. Any other questions? Because we have still time, or were we so clear that there's no... <laughs> Yes. I think you might have a remote participation question. Sorry, is there? Thank you. Amy, can you read it? Uh, Hedwig, is that fine? Uh, as you know, ICANN is a um, corporation that is run under the U.S. jurisdiction. Can ICANN deprive other countries uh, of the right to access the Internet and its digital resources uh, like CCTLD services on the basis of the legal verdict of the Is okay. Corporate. So uh, yes. So, so can uh, I can deprive other countries of the right to access uh, the internet and its digital resources like CCTLD services on the basis of the legal verdict of the American courts? Uh, what about applying super, super sanctions of digital resource like IP addresses or CCTLD based on OFAC policy in the U.S. government? Is it uh, against the human rights and international law? Can countries that are victims of destructive uh, cyber attacks, like Stuxnet in 2010, turn on international courts and file a uh, judicial case? Is there an international judicial procedure uh, for these cases in cyberspace? And then there was another one. There was also another question from the gentleman over there, I think. Yes, hi. Matthias Jackson from the Ambassador of Internet Society program. Uh, I would like to know if you, in the three areas that you have mentioned, um, have addressed or taken into account the 
judges positions and if you have done some capacity building from your network with the school of judges and all that thank you not, sorry i'm not absolutely sure that i, that I understood the, uh, the the part before capacity building i mean May I repeat? Yes, please. Yeah, sorry. Now, I wanted to know if you have t taken into account the position and the what's the thought from the judges' viewpoint. Views, views point. I mean, Supreme Court, uh, tribunals. I don't know. Thank you very much. I will. I will briefly respond to the previous question, which is, of course, a very delicate question, but that is. Unfortunately, out of scope of the, uh, of the process that we're doing. As I said, this is something that is entirely within the discussions within ICANN, and we are trying to provide a space that adds uh, an environment that allows the issues that are not within the ICANN remit and distinction to, uh, to be addressed. And an additional point is that although the title is Internet and Jurisdiction, it doesn't mean that we have the capacity to address every single jurisdictional challenge. This is exactly why the focus was in agreement with the members or the participants in the policy network to focus on very concrete issues where progress could be made. Uh, the second thing, which is the, the, the question of the relation with the judges is a very important one. Because <clears throat> interestingly enough, when we talk about governments, we usually think law enforcement agencies and so on. And the challenge for judges depending on whether they are in uh, civil law countries or uh, common law countries, but in both cases is to interpret or apply the current law, the existing law, and the current jurisprudence. And in many cases, many situations, the cases are a little bit different or the application of the existing law is raising new questions. The second thing is and this is not a, a lack of respect for the judges, the notion of training judges is something that is not really well received usually, <laughs> which is perfectly understandable. And again, it's not a criticism. However, I think, and this is something that we have thought about for a long time but have not implemented yet, and if anybody is interested in trying to, to build on the actions that are already ongoing in, in, in terms of uh, uh, processes involving judges, I believe that there is a time is ripe for a serious discussion among or with judges just in a free and open manner to think about how they handle this and in particular the fundamental question which is are we going in a direction where judges will not only implement their own national laws or the national laws of the country that they are in, but they will begin to have decisions that have extraterritorial impact. They've already moved, many of them, in the first bucket of personal jurisdiction by, for instance, accepting that they have jurisdiction over a company that provides services in the country. And I think the concept of providing services is becoming the middle ground between being accessible or having um, operations. But whether something has an extraterritorial impact is a very interesting case, and uh, Canada is well placed, and I won't put them in, on the spot, uh, under the Equistec case to see that on the right to be de indexed, the question of extraterritoriality of application is an important one. Bogdan. Yeah, uh, thank you. It, this, we have discussed this question of the role of judges intensely, and, and I think, as Bertrand mentioned that, um, they have not had the voice they deserve in the internet governance um, uh, dialogue so far. What we do actually in our uh, content group is that we check our results uh, in terms of how helpful they can be for judges. Take again what I mentioned um, like geographical proportionality. If we come up with the taxonomies there, that can be helpful for judges as well when they uh, decide whether um, um, they 
um, um, apply the law, the national law, in this way or that way, and therefore can graduate the uh, external effects. And uh, so we have the perspective of judges in mind when we work in this working group, but uh, um, you are quite right. I personally believe that uh, we could have even more dialogue with uh, judges um, themselves um, in, in the internet governance um, uh, forum. Thank you. The, the person who was asking the, the question about ICANN and its, and its jurisdiction is, is, is reposting it and, and insisting and particularly talking about attacks or uh, things like Stuxnet and, and so on. And once again, I'm awfully sorry, but the, uh, the, the topic that we're addressing are, are really out of scope of cyber weapons, for instance, or uh, the whole question of what is within the remit of ICANN. If anybody on the panel or in the room wants to answer, but it is unfortunately not in the in the remit of this space, and it doesn't, it wouldn't be appropriate for for me in this position to have any comment in that regard. Tijani, you have a question. Thank you, Bertram. When I came to this uh, network, I had this exactly the same question, and Martin can uh, certify that. Uh, I said I don't understand. Why we don't address everything? We are, we are talking about it now. It is decided now. Why we don't speak about that? And I was told that everything done in ICANN should be out of our work. Yeah. And, and this, is, this is something that is important because the goal is not to, uh, to duplicate. There are enough things to do outside of ICANN and I think it's, uh, it's important. Please. Thank you. Uh, I'd like just to add one comment in regard to what was being said before about judges. Uh, just to uh, inform that in Brazil we have had a very uh, interesting experience. This is being uh, uh, promoted by CGI.br, the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, that is partnering with judges and making sure that they are the ones who make the demand for uh, training or for capacity building. And then uh, the Brazilian State go goes there and provides the uh, workshop or make yeah. sure they, so it's important, uh, you are correct, to make sure that the demand comes from them, that yes. they are owning the, the event. Otherwise, there might be some resistance. Thank you very, very much. That was Benedicto Fonseca Filho, who was the uh, uh, ambassador for those issues in Brazil. Uh, still for the moment. It's a last question, but please go ahead. Thank you very much. Actually, it's, it's a comment. I just wanted to um, build upon this training of judges theme that's uh, being introduced. It's Joanna Kulesha. I work at the university um, in Lodz, which is in Poland. You and I met for the first time at a Council of Europe working group, and Council of Europe has had a program on the training of judges uh, within the Eastern Partnership. So this is just to flag it. I'm not sure we have the Council of Europe here in the room. Uh, but this is just to build upon the Brazilian experience. The Council of Europe has been doing a tremendous job right. training judges together with national judges institutions on human rights and the internet. Clearly, the question of internet jurisdiction is within that remit, although the focus, as uh, the case for the Council of Europe would be, would be on human rights. So there are initiatives that address the issue that is very significant and has been addressed here, but that is just to complement the Brazilian experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. You're, you're absolutely right. And actually, we are in UNESCO here, and I know also from other discussions that UNESCO has had programs regarding judges. And the Council of Europe actually organized a very, very interesting uh, seminar for uh, Supreme Court judges from the, European, uh, the, the Council of Europe in Cyprus um, last year, I think. That was uh, extremely interesting, extremely interesting in that regard. With that, we are um, spot on regarding time. I would be remiss um, to finish this session uh, without, first of all, thanking very much the people who have accepted to take their time uh, this morning to be here, um, to Luisa, to the coordinators, also to the facilitators of the uh, working groups that are in the room, and to all the members of the working groups and contact groups that are also in the room and those even who are not here because as was said before, nothing would move forward if this spirit of cooperation were not um, shared by them. And um, with that, 
Um, please go to the um, Internet and Jurisdiction site, which is internetjurisdiction.net, all attached, where you will find for each of the three tracks three documents at this stage, and there will be more afterwards. One which is a framing paper that was produced at the beginning of 2017 that explains what the problem is in each of the three tracks. The second is the policy options document that Paul mentioned that was produced as an input into the Ottawa conference. And the third one is the relevant part for each of the three tracks of the Ottawa roadmap that you will uh, feel that. And by um, the end of March, uh, you will find uh, a fourth uh, level of documents that will be the results of the working groups in the preparation of the Berlin Conference. The Berlin Conference final point is by invitation uh, and we are voluntarily limiting the amount for various reasons but also for manageability to uh, the, the number of participants to about 280 people. So there is already a significant list of actors who have been engaged in the process and are um, to be, to be there, but we will open in the coming months um, a particular part on the, on the site for expressions of interest. I must confess that in advance that we will not be able to um, um, honor every single request, but please, if you're interested, don't hesitate to uh, connect with us and to, in due time, um, apply or, or express your interest in the, uh, in the conference if that is the case. And with that, I'm extremely happy that you um, attended this session. I hope it was in instructive. And um, I wish you a very good rest of the uh, IGF. Always <laughs> <laughs> for being there. Thank you.